Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Welcome back. I'm Dan, as always, alongside Matt. And this might be the shortest show we've ever recorded now. We've never had Flames hockey canceled. No, well, you know, it's a weird situation where, like, half over half the team gets COVID all in one shot. And, yeah, it, it, that's a thing. <laughs> well, before we get there, let's talk about the two games they did play. The Flames were on tap to play four games uh, for us to recap this week, Carolina and Boston came here. Then we were supposed to go to Chicago and Nashville. Chicago and Nashville have been postponed. So why don't we jump into the Carolina game? Yeah, you know, and I just have to say, you know, you know, if we had actually got the pro- uh, prediction thread for this week, like actually accurate, oh well, we're gonna lose the first two games, and then the, we're just not gonna play anymore. You know. <laughs> Maybe that's what I'll predict next time is we just we'll play the first two and not decide not to play the second two. Yep. <laughs> so the Flames played against the Carolina Hurricanes. This is I think that I can't remember a game when people have actually cared about the Flames playing the Hurricanes, but I think a big game here with the Hurricanes where they are right now in the league and the Flames didn't fare too well. This was a 2 to 1 overtime loss for the Flames. What were your thoughts on this one? This was a game where Calgary should have won if they had any puck luck. Like, how many times did the Flames have the puck at the goal line in this game and it just not going over? Like, if any of those go in, we win the game 2-1 in regulation. So it's just really unfortunate luck. And then over time, another bad play and, yeah... Yeah, it It, is what it is. Yeah, I think puck luck was part of it. I mean, this was the third straight loss for the Flames as well, and I kind of felt like when I was watching, especially in the second, like that I I would say around the Hannafin goal there in the second, the Flames just felt like they were trying too hard. It's like they were just, they felt like they had to break the streak, and they were making some mistakes and doing some things that I don't think they would have in other games. Yeah, but they were also pretty much completely outplaying the Hurricanes, which I thought was impressive considering how good the Hurricanes have been. You know, they, like, yeah, they were making more mistakes, but, like, they, it wasn't like they were leading to a ton of grade-A chances for the Hurricanes either. No. And, and I think the biggest thing here, the Canes had 10 penalty minutes, the Flames only had 6, and really weren't able to capitalize on any of those. And that's something that this team's going to have to get back to doing is getting those uh, those power play goals. Yeah, and to be fair, the Hurricanes have one of the best penalty kills in the entire NHL. So, like, yeah, we had five power plays, but, you know, credit to the Hurricanes. They are pretty good. At they camp. are. And I was surprised when I looked back at the box score for this game how even it was. Like, shots on goal, 26-27 in favor of uh, Calgary. Faceoff percentage, 49-51 to in favor of Calgary. Uh, hits 22 to 17 in favor of Calgary. Blocks 13 13. Like the this was this was a good evenly matched hockey game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and to be fair, the Flames like despite losing the game, I thought even though like in a lot of the counting stats were evenly matched, like they looked the better team mm-hmm. for most of the game. Like, you didn't really see the Hurricanes getting too many grade-A scoring chances throughout the contest. No, you didn't. And and I think that, you know, the fact the Flames got one point here is deserved. I mean, they, they needed to get something, right? Yeah. They, you know, they worked hard. They played hard. I'm glad they got at least one point out of this. Yeah, and... You you know, there are games where you're going to lose due to the quality of the goaltending on the opposition, and just like Aiden Hill last week uh, when the Sharks beat the Flames, Frederick Anderson has been lights out since joining the Hurricanes, and, you know, there's not really much you can do when a goalie of that caliber is standing on his head. You know, it, it makes life difficult. Yeah, it does. Um, let's move on to the next game. The next game was Hockey Night in Canada. The Boston Bruins in town on the 11th to play the Flames, and this was the Flames' fourth loss in a row. Linus Olmark made 40 saves, 
and the Flames lost four to two. What were your thoughts on this one, Matt? This was a game that was bizarre in that basically every chance Boston had ended in the Flames' net, and the Flames were, I thought, the better team again in this game despite losing four to two. This was just bad goaltending by the Flames mostly. And, you know, like, the only good goal uh, by Boston, I think, was the Marchand goal. Because, uh, you know, anytime a deflection's in front of your net, like, you know, that either hits you or goes in. The other ones, though, like, if the goalie was on his game, he should have had that on each of them. And, like, Boston didn't really play that well, I didn't think. No, and I, I would say that when you put 42 shots on Linus Ulmark, you should probably beat him more than twice. Yeah, like, and to be fair, Ulmark, again, was having one of the games of his life. Because, <laughs> mm-hmm. like, you know, I actually like Ulmark when he was with the Sabres, even. And, you know, he's a good goalie. It's just, you know, there's a good goalie and, you know... <laughs> Well, and I think it shows how a goalie can be elevated behind a good team as well. Yeah, and he, yeah. And I think this is more of like what you were saying with the Hurricanes game, like where the Flames were just trying too hard, and it seems like they were just throwing anything at the net without any rhyme nor reason, just anything to, because, oh, Ulmark's Ulmark, so, oh, we should beat him, and let's just throw everything at the net instead of, being a little more patient with things. Yeah, I, I saw that. I don't know if it was because of Allmark. I took that more in this game of the Flames having troubles just with some of their zone entries and stuff. So just get it on the net and try to get in. Like, I think it's Boston is a good team. Boston is a cohesive team. And I was just looking at it as, you know what? They were playing their Boston game and Calgary is trying to do anything to solve it. Yep. And, you know, credit for Boston. They played a Boston-like game. Um... Yeah, uh, it's just another one of those frustrating things. How would you say it's like a, what uh, Peter Marr used to say, where like you can see teams are starting to lose, even though they might be winning on a winning streak, and then teams are winning before they actually start winning on a losing streak. You could see like with the LA and Anaheim games uh, last week, like the Flames shouldn't really have won either of those games and yet came out with the two points. And I I feel like in both the Hurricanes and Bruins games, like, they did more than enough in each where they should have won, but came out on the losing side of things. And, you know, th- those kind of things do balance out over the course of a season, and it's unfortunate that they didn't get any points against the Bruins, but... You know, if the Flames had carried on to play Chicago or Nashville, I feel that they would have won those games. And that puts the Flames in a four-game losing streak, which, believe it or not, even after a four-game losing streak, they've only lost seven in regulation this season. The Flames now second in the Pacific, 28 games in, 15 wins, seven losses, six overtime losses uh, for a total of 36 points, which puts them right behind the Anaheim Ducks at 37 and Vegas coming up on our rear at 34. And shockingly, the Edmonton Oilers are only like four points up on seventh, I think, in our division. So, like, you yeah, know, the Oilers are at 32, Sharks at 31, LA 29, Vancouver 28, and Seattle 23. Yeah, so um, if the Oilers keep losing, uh, yeah, they could be down in lottery pick territory soon it's the Oilers started well and I would say they're having a very Oilers season of kind of you know regressing to the mean and we all said they're probably going to lose at some point what you mean playing two guys like 30 minutes every game when they're forwards is gonna you know be a recipe for success long term we knew it had to happen I mean they lost their goaltender um, you know, they're, they're not doing as... I, I would say that, yeah, they're probably, based on what their roster is and where they're at, I would say this is probably about where they should be. You know, b- based on where they are in the on the in the standings. Yep. So, yeah, that's uh, 
that's all we got for a show. We'll see you guys next week. No, I'm just kidding. We probably won't see anyone next week. But let's talk about the the story of the week, which is uh, the COVID situation. And Matt, it's probably easier for us at this point to talk about who's not on the COVID list than who is on the COVID list. Yeah, well, when you only have six players left standing, you know, it's like, uh, yeah. <laughs> So the, the guys right now, we have one trainer, three coaches, including Daryl Sutter. It sounds like that uh, 12 Days of Christmas song. One trainer, three coaches, and six, and a whole bunch of players who are on the COVID list. The only guys not currently on the COVID list, Oliver Shillington, Matthew Kachuk, Dan Vladar, Blake Coleman, Dylan Dubé, Michael Backlund, and the man who they can't seem to kill, Michael Stone. Yeah, if anybody's going to be left standing after all this, it will be Michael Stone. Because, you know, no matter what you can do, you could throw the plague at him, he'll still be there. <laughs> if they have to uh, if if they have to play a game with whoever's left, you'll hear Beasley, you're Calgary Michael Stone! Because he'll be the only guy out there taking warm-up. Yay! My, it'll sound like a law firm. Michael Stone and company! Yeah, so the, so those are the only guys so far as we record this on Wednesday the 15th that are not on the COVID list. The rest of the team shut down for COVID. And uh, we won't go through the whole timeline here, but if anyone's interested, there's a really interesting interview with Brad Treliving on the Calgary Flames website sort of talking about the timing and when this happened and what happened, um, that sort of thing. So it's I, I think it's, it's worth worth listening to if you're curious but Matt my question's been so now what and I think that's probably on a lot of people's minds well frankly with so many like the Flames have been the hardest hit team with COVID of any team since COVID began so we're kind of in unprecedented territory because like we can play one line and have a spare (laughs) there's no realistic way that the NHL can expect the team to carry on until, like, most of the guys are through the 10-day quarantine period minimum. Like, it's just one of those weird situations where, like, too many people got it all at once. Well, let's talk about what the, what kind of the rulebook says. And you can tell this rulebook was written for, um, you know, maybe two, three guys that are sick. Um, Friend of the show, Ryan Pike, or no, it was Khaled... Uh, Khaled Kashavji wrote this on uh, on the win column is where I found it so if you're interested check out the win column for his article but really interesting about how the CBA rules affect the Flames Matt I'll just go through a few things that we have in here the general rules that if a team has 18 or more skaters and two goalies available and have less than 800k in salary cap they need to play one game with the players they do have available which is not us we don't have 18 or more and I can see why 18 or more is the rule. If you have one guy out, right, just play with who you got, even if it's your star, and sub them in later. Uh, following that, they're able to call up uh, players with a cap hit of 850 or less to substitute for the missing players. These do not count against the cap, but once the players in COVID protocol are deemed fit to play, the substitute players must be sent back. So, I mean, at the time, the Flames had had only six players in COVID protocol when this was written, which was Richardson, Lindholm, M- uh, Monjapani, Rajishka, uh, Zadorov, and Tanev, along with one staff member. So the, I think what we were all thinking at the time was that the Flames would probably run without those guys, end up playing the Columbus game, and then start subbing guys like Godden, Walker Dewar, Matthew Phillips, Justin Kirkland, Pospisil, uh, Nick DeSimone, Alex Walensky up onto the roster just to fill spots but with what seven guys now i mean there's no way this team's playing hockey for a couple weeks and there's no way we're going to the states no uh because like if they do go to the united states like they have to spend two weeks in quarantine before they're able to come back into canada again so like there's just no realistic way that the team can actually travel to the states for any reason and Thankfully, like after Christmas, there's only one game in the near future that's in the States, and that's in Seattle, which that game can either be postponed or, you know, Seattle might have to, like, swap. Like, we play that in Canada in a later game against the 
um, Kraken will have to that would be here will have to be played there. Even if we could get over there, I think right now with provinces starting to you know tell people not to travel and you know we're expecting to see some more restrictions here in the country. I think that the Canadian government would ask the Flames not to even if they could to set an example. I think it's tough to say no one's allowed to travel at Christmas, but the Flames have COVID and they can travel. Yeah, like it's just not realistic, and I think that. You know, as bad as it sounds uh, with this latest Omicron variant, that it, the league might have to shut down again, or at least shut down the fans, and like we might be going into another little bit of a blip because like the, it's not just the Flames that are having COVID issues right at the moment. Like there's four or five teams that are dealing with their own variations of what we are. And the f- the flames are the hardest hit though I think since this whole thing happened. Yeah, they are. Vancouver almost, was the hardest hit last year, but I remember uh, that. Yeah, uh, this year it's ours is, it easily surpasses what the Canucks did. So I was looking it up, and I've looked it up in the past, but I looked it up just to see if the league did say Calgary play with who you've got available, and I kind of thought they might do that for the Saturday or the twenty first game. Believe it or not, it's never been used since the Montreal Maroons were in the league, but Rule 66 in the rule book under Section 9, Other Fouls, there's a forfeit rule. And I think if I was the Flames and they said, go out there with seven guys, I'd say if we forfeit it, can we count that as our one game played before we get to make call-ups? And I'd probably just forfeit that game. Yeah, well, and I think that the the Flames would be just petitioning the league of, like, this is not fair at all to us under any circumstance. Because, like, give me a break. Our whole freaking team is gone. <laughs> like, you know, it, it, it's just, like, there's no realistic way that, like, the, the team or the league could have foresaw that, oh, your whole entire roster, except for, like, a handful of guys... Are left standing like it, it, and we know that by this time tomorrow, when this, sh- when everyone hears this show, f- two or three of those guys are going to be on the list as well. Oh yeah, and it's just going to be a never-ending stream of this until probably January, where like the Flames players are testing positive, and you know it it sucks, but like it, I just don't foresee the NHL having any recourse like uh, unless they just basically say hey go play Stockton up as your team for yeah you know. but even that's going to cause issues because then what are they doing with the AHL lineups like it's uh, and you probably then got to quarantine all those guys because they're coming from the states like I don't even know that, that really helps yeah it's a bit of a gong show if, if our team was in Abbotsford or playing out of Calgary like they were last year it's one thing but I, I don't think right now with what we're seeing with the Omnicron stuff that the answer is to bring in 20 guys from the AHL. Yeah. It, yeah. Like, it, there's no easy answer because of the fact that this is unprecedented. And, frankly, I think that, like, the, they should just basically fl- shut the flames down till Christmas and then see how things are and how the team is. And- well, and, and they're pretty much shut down... But till Christmas. I mean, there's no announcement on the 21st or 23rd. Those are the last two games, but I think those will be. But if I look at the roster, we have one, two, three, four, five games left this month, uh, four of which are supposed to be at home, and then they go on a week-long road trip. And again, I can't see them wanting to send this team out to the States on the 2nd of January. My guess right now, Matt, is they shut this team down until the 8th which starts a home swing, or I guess the 11th, which starts a home swing of the Islanders, Ottawa, Vegas, Florida, then we go to Edmonton, then St. Louis comes here, and then we go to Columbus and St. Louis at the end of the month. Like I kind of think we'll see these guys shut down until the 11th, because there's no way you're sending them to the States the first week of January. Yeah, unless like everybody's healthy by then and... Yeah, you know, but like honestly, with how Omicron's hitting, like I would not be shocked. Well, if, and he, like and the even league, if we're healthy, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if someone else isn't. Yeah, and that that's where it's like uh, the entire league might be shut down for a bit, or you know, like some variation of that, just because of the fact that like you know, it, another wave of BS is incoming. For everybody, so you know it might be another one of those situations where, like the the league might need to put 
the hit the pause button for a little bit and it it almost feels like March of 2020 again. Yeah. Like it kind of feels like we were almost through this thing and then we're resetting it. Um I mean I don't want to get into covid discussion here but I will say I don't think they're going to the Olympics. Oh uh, to me like I I think that's a 0% chance like and because of that, I think it's good that they have time to schedule those games they need to. Because right now, the Flames are set to be off from February 3rd to February 23rd. If they're off, like I said, until the 11th of January, that's 13 games that would need to be rescheduled. So I think you could fit those 13 games in those 20 days if you had to. Yeah. And even then, I think that like the league might tack on some time at the end of the season and just, you know, like, who cares if the playoffs run into July and August again? Because, you know, I think that because of the whole situation that the league needs to be flexible with timelines again and, like... I just don't know the league has the same flexibility. Last year, they were the only ones using these buildings. They could do whatever they want to. I have to imagine that the Stampede starting to book concerts. I have to imagine that other venues have other things. I don't think you can just use those, those you know, buildings for two, three weeks in every building. Yeah, and... You know. When they were the only ones running last year, they'd get whatever date they wanted. Yeah, uh, it's going to be interesting to see, but, it, you know, there are only so many things that you can do, and, you know, if it requires, like, either canceling games outright or, you know, shifting them to the end of the season or playing during the Olympics or, or, or you know, like, there, there's going to be some variation to all this uh, because the league wants the revenue A- and B, you know, they want there to be playoffs in the Stanley Cup Finals and all that. So, and I'm just looking at our schedule. I mean, there's dates here, like in April. We play on the 16th and then not again until the 21st. So you could drop a game or two in there if you need to. Like, I think there's enough space within probably everyone's schedule, even outside the Olympics. You could add a game here, a game there. We have a, a Colorado road game in March where we go to Colorado, then two days off, then we're back here. Like, I think you could probably drop a couple games in somewhere if you need to. Yeah, exactly. Um, one way or another, they'll figure out which and what and where and how to get these games played again. But it's looking like it's going to be everybody dealing with this kind of stuff over the next few weeks. I don't think the league is... I think they're going to do everything they can to get games played, even if they have to be neutral site games of some kind, just because I think they need the TV revenues. Yeah, um, well, I think that, like, at a minimum, you'll see them, like, going no fans in the stands again. That's what, what I was like, say, yeah. You know, like, realistically, like, now that, like, it's not, like, the Canada division again, like, I could see even, like, if stuff hits the fan again where they need to not have... Uh, like um, fans in the stands. Like I could see all the Canadian teams playing out of whichever U.S. city is convenient. Uh, sort of like the Toronto Blue Jays last year playing out of Buffalo for like the first half of the season, just because hey, it's you know we don't have to cross the border, and you know just having home games in whichever place makes sense. And we've already seen it was announced in in uh, auto in Ontario that the Toronto Maple Leafs and the Ottawa Senators will have their venue capacity reduced to 50% for home games. So, yeah, I think I think they're going to do everything they can to keep us. I mean, these teams have been pretty safe, let's be honest. Besides the Flames, they've done a pretty good job of moving back and forth on the border with all the teams and being safe, and I think they can probably continue to do that. The NHL is taking an abundance of caution, which I appreciate. But I think that the first step before you start eliminating games or moving them to the States is getting rid of the fans if you have to. Yeah. Not ideal. Oh, no, of course not. But, uh, you know, we're dealing with bizarro times, and, you know, you have to make do with what you can. And the games have to be played. So it's figure out how best to manage that for everybody and go from there. I'm just looking at the list here of guys who have COVID, and uh, Byron Ferrosi got recalled, and he's even got COVID. So, like, they're, thanks, they're guys. I really appreciated coming back to the NHL. 
<laughs> like you called me, you called me up, and then you get me sick. What the heck? Um, and, and I think you know we're looking at this as NHL players, but we have to look at the bigger issue too. A lot of these guys have family, have kids. Like I think the biggest thing here is to make sure they're not spreading to their families and that stuff too. So this could become a big mess if this many guys are going home. You know, it's giving it to their kids. Kids are going to school. Wives are going to work. Girlfriends are going to work. Like I think. You know, the, the we the Flames really just need these guys to lock themselves in, even if that means buying them a hotel and getting them away from their family, just to, to keep this from spreading in the community. Yeah, and, you know, like, that's going to be a difficult thing, especially with so many of the Flames players and staff getting it and, the, like, incubation time and et cetera, et cetera, that, you know, like, even then, like, I'm sure that most of the Flames players, significant others, and children would have already been exposed. So, like, it's going to be difficult to keep that in. Like, I'm sure that, like, once the positives hit, they they did. But, you know, it, it might have been, like, too little too late even at that point. So... It's going to be tough, and the impact just to the community as a whole is going to be a big deal. It's just hopefully they can mitigate it as much as possible. And, like, this whole situation is just, you know, I think, like, everybody's tired of dealing with COVID BS. And, like, this is just, like, another fresh wave of more BS that, you know, and it's, like, again, really. I think... It'll be interesting to see, and this question was asked of Brad Trilliving at the media availability he did, which, I mean, I, I can't accept, I can't blame him for not really giving an answer to it, but some people asked, you know, when you've been, this team has been pretty good. I mean, the Flames have had the one of the least numbers of issues so far, and someone asked, do you kind of get complacent to maybe not taking all the precautions you should be? And I'm wondering if, with this happening to the Flames, is this going to sort of renew or change the NHL's protocols going forward? Saying, look, we had a whole team out. We had to reschedule a lot of games. And hopefully no one's going to have lingering issues because of this. I mean, we've seen a, a, at least one NFL player who hasn't played in over a year because of this. So I think the the big question well, is going to uh, be... Actually, um, Archibald uh, for the Oilers, like he had myocarditis from this. And like he's, oh, he hasn't played either since... Okay. So, but he wasn't vaccinated either, so that's kind of a different situation, but... Yeah. You know, like, it, it yeah, uh, like, hopefully none of the Flames players, and to be fair, like, none of them have really shown any symptoms since this all has happened. It's just, you know, you don't want any lingering effects either. No, and I, I'm just hoping that this, you know, that... If, if things need to be changed, I mean, the NHL is apparently doing the best of all the sports leagues in, term of, in terms of keeping people safe, so that's good to hear, but I'm hoping this might sort of give them that renewed, okay, we should look at what we're doing, even with away teams and stuff, because, you know, bringing teams back and forth over the border, who knows if the tests are being done, especially on the U.S. side, um, I, I think it's probably just a good time to relook at all the protocols now in yeah. light of this. Oh, yeah, and especially with, like, just how severely we've been hit, and, like, Ottawa was hit really bad earlier. Like, they had 11 guys or something like that out at one point, and, you know, like, that. I remember that game against the Senators where, like, they had nine different skaters that were, like, playing in their first game of the season just because, hey, you know, we need bodies, and, you know... Yeah, it, it's going to be an odd situation for sure. Odd is probably the best way to say it, but um, I don't know, Matt. I, I think that's about all we have to cover for the Flames, just hoping uh, that... The actually, we do have one other bit of news um, that apparently in January, the rumor is that uh, they're going to break ground on the new building. So, you know, that parking lot's going to get trashed pretty soon. Yeah, that's the rumor. I don't know, right... Uh, I just think with everything else going on, I'm not sure it'll happen in January. We'll, well see. Well, you see, it'll be just in time to start it up, and then everybody that works there will have to go on COVID protocols. And <laughs> Well, I just don't know that, yeah, I mean, we can have, I don't want to get into a, a debate about, you know, politics and stuff, but I'm just not sure that January is the right time with, you know, people going back to work and that sort of thing and getting the, the manpower to do it. 
but yeah, we'll see. That that's apparently when it's supposed to happen. But we'll see if that does happen. We'll see if it happens in January or not. But um, it, it's exciting. And if you haven't seen the renderings, the renderings for the new building are available all over the web. Take a look at it. It's it's a very different looking building than the Sal Dome. And it's funny because in the renderings, you can actually see the Sal Dome off in the distance, which we know is not going to happen because sadly the plans to raise the dome. So it's almost like they're teasing us. Yeah. For five minutes, the Saddle Dome will be. <laughs> you can almost see it, the ribbon cutting. As they cut the ribbon in the background, you're seeing the Saddle Dome falling. Yeah. <laughs> in with the, out with the old, in with the new. Um, so I think that's really all we've got this week, Matt. Yeah, it's kind of um, tough, really. Like it's it's, it's kind of weird, too. Like, in March of 2020, the whole league shut down. And to me, it's weird that sort of the league is happening around us. Like, even, you know, the first two games this week, other teams are playing. Edmonton's losing. Other teams are playing. But it's like we've been, you know, the league's happening without us. It's like someone forgot to tell us that we're playing hockey this week. Yeah. Well, you know, it could be worse. We could be doing what the Oilers are doing and just getting skunked like they have been. Well, to be honest, we went on a four-game losing streak. Yeah. And that's I think that's another thing maybe that, you know, people aren't looking at here is the even the healthy players can't be training. So I think if we are shut down until the beginning of January, these guys aren't going to have been on the ice or be training. Like, there's going to be uh, some hiccups coming out of this to get this team back up to speed. Yeah, and, and you know, the only real benefit of this uh, it, on the personal side of things is that at least it's before Christmas, so, you know, like, if uh, people are, you know, like, say, like, their significant others get it, too, the, at least, like, they can be kind of home for Christmas, you know, like, it, it's a small thing, but you know, it's just, yeah, this whole thing is just quite the gong show. So we are not going to be doing a show next week on the 22nd because at, be or at best there's going to be one game to talk about and uh, it's not worth doing a show for one game. So we don't know what the future is going to look like for us in the next couple of weeks. Um, we really need to see what things look like for the Flames. So the earliest we will be back will be the 29th. But uh, check our social media, fi Fireside Chat, everywhere you can find us. Uh, on Facebook, we're facebook.com slash Fireside Chat. On Twitter, we're at, at Fireside Podcast. On Instagram, we're Fireside Chat underscore podcast. We're on YouTube. Every, anywhere you find us and, and our website, uh, check there and you'll see when the the next show comes out because we don't even know when we're going to be broadcasting next. It really depends when the Flames are playing. If the games are canceled, like Matt said, right through Christmas, um, we probably won't be doing the 29th either. Yeah, it just, uh, you know, if we don't have anything to report, you know, like we can come and hang out and chat, but um, I don't know anybody wants to hear that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know. can give an over an overview of what Santa brought us each and stuff like that. Yeah. So. Well, you know, it might be a, an interesting thing to do, like especially like if we're into the new year with like <laughs> you know this still happening, uh, maybe doing a panel show or something with like Mike and all that. Just we'll for, see. Just for something I to do, because I I have a strong feeling that right now we're going day by day because we're trying to figure out what was going on with the Flames. I think that by, I mean they've sold some games around Christmas. People have bought those as Christmas presents. I think they're going to need to tell people what's going on here sooner rather than later. I'm guessing. Just no, I don't have any league sources that have told me this, but my guess is that by Sunday the nineteenth. We're going to figure out the what happens for the rest of the month. Yeah, because realistically, like, if the Flames are still in that, you know, like, because you need to have, if I recall correctly, 10 days after your last positive test. Uh, so, like, back into negative test zone. Um, you know, like, you're, like, even if guys, like, the first batch of players that got it are like now today healthy like you're still looking after christmas and like with each passing day like you know w the flames do play four games i do believe between the 27th and the 31st 
So it's like three, three Edmonton, Seattle, Winnipeg. And yeah. then they have one on the 23rd. Yeah. So three games between the 27th and the 31st, like, you know, the, the longer this goes where they're still, you know, recovering from COVID, like the longer and more and, you're going to need to wipe and out. If I was the coach, I mean, I don't know if the GM gets any say, but if I was the coach, I would say, to my general manager, you know what? Even if our guys are healthy by the 21st, let's ask the lead delay us till the new year so we can at least get back on the ice. I mean, if we're saying, hey, our guys are healthy enough that, you know, they've, they're have they out of quarantine, but they can't play or they can't travel to the U.S. yet, let's get some practice time in this month since some of these guys, will, you know, will be not on the ice for two weeks and be ready to go for that road trip in January. Yeah, it, like it... It's just nuts, like, this whole situation. And, like, I, I'm just hopeful that, um, like, between... It feels like there's another shoe to drop, as they say. Like, you know, I, I hate to say that, but Calgary's got it. But, I mean, if our whole team's got it, we played other teams. Like, you know, we're seeing the numbers ramping up everywhere. I'm honestly expecting that we're going to see other whole teams fall. I don't I don't want to say that, but that's my expectation. Yeah. Like, frankly, I would not be shocked if, like, the whole league doesn't decide to just shut down for a bit. Um... Yeah, like uh, we'll see. Like it, it's gonna be a weird time. Either that, or like the league just kind of, you know, like eases restrictions entirely and just says, "Well, uh, yeah, we don't care that you're sick. Go out there and play." Yeah, I, that's not gonna happen. And I mean, that that w- the league, I don't think will do that. The player association is gonna step in and say, "No, we're not doing that." So even if the league said that, I don't think that would go over. Yeah, I don't either. It's just I'm just trying to think of like any situation where, yeah, like this whole thing is just so unprecedented and bizarre that it's just hard to see exactly where, like in two weeks even, where this is going to go. We'll find out, Matt. Yep. That's all we can do is wait and see. I mean, we have no control over this or what happens so all we got to do is sit and wait and you know hope that everybody is recovers well and again their families don't get sick and i would rather we take the time we need than rush guys back especially pro athletes who we want to make sure they're healthy and these guys make their living on their bodies i want to make sure that we're not rushing them back to play games but that they're truly healthy yeah and yeah like uh Worst case scenario is that we'll see a bunch of players from Stockton for a game or two or three. And, you know. And even that, I mean, I, you know, let's say that was what they want to do. I can't see them saying, oh, by the way, it's almost Christmas. Get up here and sit in a hotel room for two weeks and not be with your loved ones. Like, I think that's going to have to be well planned out too if those guys have to quarantine. I think what you'd almost do is the Flames are going to the States. I think you just pick those guys up in the States. They don't need to go through the international quarantine if you could. Yeah. Because much you want your NHL shot, I think it it would suck to say, oh, I don't get to see my family because I'm sitting in a hotel room in Calgary over Christmas. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think if they want to do that, I think the way to do it would be, I mean, they they have a Chicago, Florida, Tampa, Carolina road swing. Meet those guys in Chicago. Yeah. And then even if you have to, return them to the AHL before you come back to Calgary for the game on the 11th. Yep. Yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens, but I think that's about all we can talk about now. The rest is just our thoughts, and we have no inside information, but keep checking our social media. Keep checking... Um, social media for the team and I'm sure we'll all find out very shortly what's going to happen yep Uh, fun times that's all we can do is just wait and see at this point yep so Matt I will say that I'm going to cross out our prediction game for this week because we can't predict on something that didn't happen and if I had an Xbox handy maybe I'd simulate the other two games but I don't so we'll we'll just assume that uh, this week didn't happen in terms of our prediction game yeah um yeah it's it is what it is and all right well matt i think that's about it for us yeah so i'll sign off a little differently and say get well soon flames get well soon fireside chat is hosted by dan stevenson co-hosted by matt deborg this episode produced and edited by peter marino 
Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.